All right, everybody, Tong Talks here, and I got to tell you right now, super duper pumped, super special guest here, friend from back in the Bay days, director John M. Chu. I mean, I don't even want to list your credentials. Uh, do, we, do we have to? Yeah. Should we? Yes. Crazy Rich Asians, Jam and the Holograms, G.I. <laughs> Joe to Retaliation. I did watch the Justin Bieber film when it came nice. out. Never seen I did, that. and it was actually really good, for Thank the record. You. That. Thank Very you. good. Um, Step up, like I mean, what else, what else do you? Is there any other franchises that you want to remind people you might have been involved? In? Virgin America safety video. If oh yes, yes. Virgin America. Your background looks like a Virgin America safety video right now. It's I mean, like if I world. wanted to change it to pink right now, I could. You could do it. You could do it. <laughs> Bring back old school. Now that's a memory. It's crazy. It's but crazy. then I would be forced to dance, and I can't dance nearly as good as they dance. Oh, that's good. See, you could literally do the whole safety video from that moment. <laughs> Where's the, um, the flotation device? Yeah. <laughs> that's the, for people. For people that aren't that don't realize what we're talking about, the dancing instructional Virgin video that is arguably, and I'm not even saying this because we're friends, arguably the best airlines instructional video we have ever seen. Uh, thank That's you. not even debatable. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, if you, if you actually look up on Google Virgin America safety video, there are people who've done versions of it themselves, the same the, the <laughs> song. And there's this one like a, a, a classroom who did it in like Taiwan. And it is amazing. They recreated every detail of it with like paper and uh and <laughs> flashlights and it's it's pretty amazing you gotta check that out so you know being an artist and a creator like that for yourself you know you inspire other people to kind of create and it kind of creates this circle of creativity you know this is why you got involved in the business but has that kind of surprised you in ways of just kind of i don't want to call it the remix but creativity inspires creativity inspires inspires yeah i mean no, it doesn't surprise me only because I, I didn't start that circle. I'm, I'm, I'm a part of that circle. Mm -hmm. I was inspired myself by living in the Bay Area. Uh, as you know, uh, there's creators and engineers uh, every corner, especially when we grew up there. It sure. wasn't about like the dot com boom before that. It was like engineers are king. People were creating things. It wasn't they weren't on the cover of magazines quite yet. Um, so Steve Jobs was already a superstar there, maybe not around the world, but there he already was. So. Um, it was, to me, uh, it had started back then when I would go and my parents have a restaurant in the Bay Area, as you know, and, and when customers would come in, they would bring in uh, hardware and software in beta form to give to me. I was the youngest of five kids uh, because they knew, oh, the chef's son loves to make videos. And so I, I was always inspired by these engineers who didn't seek fame and fortune, gave to me to create, gave me tools um, and as a kid who, you know, didn't, couldn't do anything else, uh, editing and filming became a, a place for my voice. And so uh, I love that, um, you know, along the way, going to USC film school and all that stuff, uh, different scholarships, different groups who really opened the doors for me that we can now give back and make uh, content that uh, reflects who we are uh, as a generation of both Asian Americans and as just a new generation uh, of Americans. Um, and uh, inspire other people to tell their own stories and have that confidence to do so. Man, you know, tying that barrier of love because for people that are watching, John and I, when we were younger, went to the same church together. We weren't right. always there at the same time, but we went to the same church together. So we, we yeah. got this Bay connection. The connection to your dad's restaurant, here's a little quick one before we talk about things that people want to listen to. So Chef Choose <laughs> is the name of the restaurant in Los Altos. Yep. Is it considered Los Altos? Yeah. Yes, yeah, considered um, Los Altos. Right on the edge. Right yeah. on that corner on El Camino. El Camino, San Antonio, right there. So your dad used to do, back in the day when high schools had like career days, <laughs> your dad actually came into Monta Vista High School where I went. And at the time you would have to sign up to, which, you know, there's like, there was always the beekeeper that had the honey. <laughs> there's, there's a firefighter, there's the engineer, but your dad was the chef that came to our school. And so what I did is instead of going to all the different ones, I remember not knowing at the time that he was your dad, I went to his class thing, three out of the five that I could. And I was just like, kept on eating. I'm like, oh man, because you know, food is creativity. Food is inspiration. We, you know, quite honestly, Asian culture, kind of foodie is one of those things that's kind of part in, in our DNA. So yeah. then I told my family, oh, I went, I'm like, let's go to Chef Chu's. I told my mom and dad, like, he'll remember me. Like I went to his thing three times 
And they were like, no, he's not going to remember you. Like, they're like, no way, Chef Chu. Because, you know, you have to remember this is before internet, before, like, Chef Chu still is, but he's like big deal. Martin Yan can cook, stuff like that, right? These <laughs> yeah. Asian chefs, when you don't have that many images of people that have, you know, achieved success in media that are Asian. So we go over there. And right when I came in, you know, he, he's always busy, but he came up to the upstairs area in the back and I said, Hey, Chef Chu. And he's like, Hey, you were in my, you were at that uh, career day. Cause we went maybe a week later and I looked at my family. I'm like, yeah, I told you he'd remember me. <laughs> like, it's like, <laughs> but it's like little silly nuggets and moments like that. And unbeknownst to me, you know, he, he is your dad. And, you know, we've kind of been in touch with all these years. I mean, you talk about Apple and all these gadgets and people may not know, but you're an Apple freak. Like before, you've always been busy. You're busier than you've ever been before. But whenever there was Apple launches, you and I would be DMing on Twitter about like the latest iPad, the iPhone all it's the no time. Joke. And you're just it's geeking no out. Two in the morning, three in the morning, doesn't matter. We're, we're there on launch day. I mean, it used to be better when we could camp out outside of the stores. That Those days are over now. But I used to skip school for Macworld uh, for a week. <laughs> Like literally, me and my friend would go and, and, and just not show up at school and, and, and be uh, uh, not by the beach drinking. No, we'd be at the at Mac World looking at all the newest USB things that were coming um, or new monitors or video cards at that time. Uh, it was it, we, we even went to New York for Mac World when it came to New York. Dude, so, really? Uh, I wouldn't say I'm a, a, a Mac freak. I, I'm, I'm like Mac family. Like it just mm. didn't. It bred me, so. Yeah, I mean, it's hard being in the Bay Area. My, my parents are both teachers. They'd bring the Mac from their school, and we would get to play with it for the whole summer. So I was indoctrinated, like, way – the brainwashing started super, super early for me. Now, for you, obviously, obviously as a producer, film director, you know, you always tell me, like, I love the iPad. When's the newest iPad coming out? What's up with that pencil? Is that a tool that you still use today? Or, you know, how are some of this tech – kind of integrated into your workflow we see the iMac in the back but you know how, how is that for you what, what what are some things that you kind of use and goof around with i'm going to close this for one second because there's uh someone doing uh you, can, you know honestly back. you can't even hear it that bad it's it not right even that bad it's you can hear it a little bit but it's not that bad all right he'll, he'll be gone in a second all right it's, it's covid dude it's covid <laughs> it's life this, this is our new our new normal things just are happening um, no, tech is a huge part. In fact, I think it gives me the edge every time when I'm, if I know how to use a program, first of all, like growing up, knowing Photoshop, knowing After Effects, um, uh, knowing how, how to edit on, on Premiere and then Final Cut, Media 100, like to me, uh, 3D Studio Max back in the day, oh like gosh. knowing these things allowed me as a literal 17 year old to go into a room full of adults and show them a vision for something and wow them. And all, and all I was doing was using these very powerful programs and just knowing how to do minimal things even with it uh, gave me the sort of stepping stones to present and communicate what was in here that wasn't reality yet and show what it could be. And that was key to everything. Even to this day when I pitch um, a project to a studio, if I know the latest stuff, um, it helps bridge a gap between uh, my brain and, and, and what I'm going to be doing. Even resources of how to find images, how to collect uh, sounds or music or video clips. Um, all, all those are not uh, for nothing. Everything I, I've, I learn is able to communicate, communicate, communicate. We're in the business of creating something out of nothing. So anything that we can help um, people understand what's in our head is, is very helpful. So um, I use that tech all the time. You know, I'm, I just got the A7 s3 right here dude I, ha I have the box i haven't cracked it open but let's okay, go as let's a filmmaker as a on. filmmaker tell me about this thing for you oh my this is this is a beautiful camera I, oh i got that moment uh nd uh filter variable nd filter on the end of it um i love it so far you know i'm brand new at it right now i have the a9 where's my a9 over here <laughs> <laughs> um, and I love, I love the A9, but I needed a, something that's a little more video. Uh, I want to do more video. I haven't shot a lot. I, I've been really into stills. So the uh, video aspect of it, you know, my kids basically, I have a collection of videos. I have all these, check this out. <laughs> yeah, show it, show it, baby. You want to go old tech. 
I have my VCR over there because I have a VHS. Oh, man. Oh. Uh, people, with all yo, these... people, that are, people don't even know what you're holding up right now. Oh, yeah, you don't know what it is. Okay. <laughs> exactly. No, 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 no. Hold it up and explain. Yeah, by yes. the way, is these are these things are like half VHS tapes that you would put into a recorder and you would cord. See, there's the there's the magnetic tape. This is like my this is from 1988, folks. 19, I don't know if you can see that in the thing. Yeah, 1988. Oh, man, my mom's handwriting. I took all her tapes from um, from the Bay Area. I was like, I'm gonna digitize this because this stuff is about to like collapse. So then you open up this VHS tape. <laughs> I told and you put this inside. You put this inside there like this. I forgot how to do this for a while, and then it lifts up that thing, and then now the magnetic tape is in. The, and then you put this in a VCR, and then you can digitize it. Um, I connect it to the. I don't even know what it's. I think it's the Elgato like video or whatever. Um, and then I digitize it and I have it forever, and it doesn't. Um, the magnetic tape, if it breaks one day, it doesn't matter because it's on the hard drive. So anyway, so, you just so, blew people. You just blew people's minds. I mean, there's, you know, like you know, we're 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 older cats. We've been around a little bit. We don't may not look it. I know. Asian don't raise it, but how old we are, right? But like you know, for seeing that, it's even nostalgic and it's fun for me. But I, I think about like my nieces and my nephews. They're like, what? Is, what is this? This is the only. This is the only videotape that I need tape like that's physical <laughs> this stuff yeah. disintegrates and back then you're like oh 30 years it'll disintegrate it, it doesn't matter now we're like oh it's 30 years this stuff is going to turn to dust <laughs> um so anyway that's why i always also like you know when i have hard drives full of videos or things that i want to keep um if it's on firewire 400 oh then i got gosh. i have to transfer it to you know firewire 800 or just continue to follow it because at some point that <coughs> medium there's my dog again at some point that um that media is going to putter out and we don't really think about it right now but if you don't transfer as you know even the ios or not ios but any operating system <laughs> as it progresses you won't be able to use your zip drive <laughs> I just brought up zip drive. I, I knew I was going to say zip drive when you were talking about Macworld. I was like, ooh, zip drive days. I have piles of zip drives. Let me, give me one second. Come oh, on. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. COVID error. <laughs> um, this is so real. That's why I love it. This That's straight up real right there, man. No joke, guys. Uh, a long day of shooting. No matter what happens, I'm working with big movie stars doing all this. I have to come home and still clean up my dog's shit. So that never changes, guys. That never changes. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's why I have to buy myself little toys to keep myself, buy my own trophies. It's the best, one of the best lessons I ever learned. Someone told me, you know, this is not AYSO soccer. You're not going to, no one's going to come and give you a ribbon and a trophy. You have to buy your own. So every time you, uh, do something that you are proud of for yourself, you got to buy your own trophy. So every time I, I feel proud, I, I, uh. I pick myself a little, a little gadget, or if I feel bad, if I did something terrible, I also buy myself a gadget. So, but you, Maybe you know, like John, to buy stuff. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, you know, John. What's cool about just seeing you geek out about this stuff and talk about kind of you have to go get it, you have to learn these tools. Yeah, obviously that has been imprinted into your DNA, and obviously that has led to you to be able to direct these amazing films and really get to the get to where you are. You know, you can see people that are watching this that may not you know, see you just casually in your home goofing around. This is, this is kind of, you know, inherent to you. It's in your bloodstream. And so, you know, yeah, yeah. when I want to talk about like the film work that you've done, first of all, you know, in the Heights that when I, when I saw the and for people that don't know, but people that do, right. It's been pushed back or out to, is it June? Is it June 21st? June 20, uh, June 18, 18, June 18, year, 20, yeah. 2021. Okay. Crazy. And that's crazy. So, you know, getting to that point, you know, it feels like that movie is a culmination of all these skills you have developed and different projects you've worked on over time, drama, dance, music, visuals, yeah. um, and kind of showing how even deep in your heart, you have that kind of innovative spirit of like, we're going to find ways to do this. H how was that experience for you? I mean, you named your son after the movie, so that it has to be pretty <laughs> damn special. Yes. My son is named Jonathan Heights Chu. Um, we were shooting in the Heights when he when he was born. So uh, and I was so uh, taken by that community, Washington Heights, um, which is where Lin Manuel Miranda uh, grew up and, and still lives. And I got to he he, he really introduced me to that uh, that part of town. Uh, Kiara, who also uh, who's a writer, also lives there. And um, 
what an honor it is to like represent a a block, few blocks, a neighborhood um, that, by the way, I am not from, and I am not Latino. Um, <laughs> what? So, yeah, it's true. Who would guess? Crazy. Um, that having come from Crazy Rich Asians, I learned a lot about uh, what to protect, what to give room for when you're shooting, what kind of dialogue should be had, how open of a platform it should be for people to speak up if something is not authentic or right. Um, and so I really took those lessons and was more of a steward on In the Heights uh, with Lynn and Kiara to help translate uh, this community that they're from and our actors as well. We had constant conversations. Uh, and then on top of it, it's music that was written by Lynn um, about this neighborhood that he had never seen performed in this neighborhood. It had only been downtown and Broadway. Um, this town had never even uh, seen a production of it because all the productions were on Broadway. Um, so it was amazing uh, to be a part of that, to be a witness of that. And yes, it is a culmination of everything I've done in terms of collaboration, music, dance. I took all my skill sets to help uh, steward this story. Of course, a Broadway translation to a movie is very, is not easy. Um, and Lynn allowed me to make adjustments to make sure that it could translate well. And it wasn't, it's not a replacement for the show. It's a companion piece for that. In the same way that Crazy Rich Asians, the movie is a companion piece for the book. It's actually very different than the book uh, when people go back and realize it, but it feels like the book. And I think that's the most important. And we also were able to instill new relevant messages for today since, um, you know, In the Heights was written uh, over a decade ago and, and there are new issues um, that arise. Um, and so we, we, we got to we got to do that. And so it was a it was a blast and I can't wait for people to see it when movies, if movies open up again, mm. they will open up again. I know people are hungry for it. And I think it'll feel like a breath of fresh air when you witness it. It deserves to be on the big screen. These actors, Anthony Ramos, Leslie Grace, Melissa Barrera. I mean, it's all these people uh, on the big screen are the most beautiful, um, talented people you will see um, uh, in a long time. So, You know, I, I appreciate you you know, making the time to come and hang out and talk because, you know, you, you won't say it out loud, but, you know, at least perception for someone who is outside of Hollywood and, you know, people that are outside this, right? The idea, it still holds true. The idea of an Asian American director is just not common, you know, and, and you've been, and you know that, and you've been there for Crazy Rich Asians and In the Heights. But what you said, which is really interesting, is about listening to your cast, making sure this is authentic, and that comes from a position where I've got to imagine, right? You know, this is not, you are one of, I don't even know, one of one, one of five per se, like Asian American directors. And so that thinking comes from your experiences of, you've been in situations where they didn't consider, you know, the cast or maybe people of color and decisions because yeah. they didn't understand or didn't want to hear. And they're like, I just got to get this movie done. Yeah, exactly. So, so how was that your journey through this kind of really influence that? And how have you seen kind of the fruits of that come to life in your filmmaking? Um, well, well, first of all, there, there are a lot of Asian directors, so an, but the Asian American director in studio films is, is, is more rare. And by the way, that's, that's changing really quickly. It's amazing to see the new talent um, coming up. And it's great because it shows um, the point of view. I mean, in a way, uh, we're here to save cinema because all these other diverse voices are needed because uh, movies uh, are, are now, uh, you know, they get boring when it's from the same perspective over and over again for 100 years. Um, so it's time to turn the page. And we see it in the stories that are told um, that it was, movies have always been about bringing the world to an, 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 a new perspective, a new place. Um, to expose them to new things and um, allow them to uh, see the world differently in their real lives. So, so that that is really exciting for me. And I've been able to see, you know, I've been in the business for, I don't know, over, over a decade. I've been able to see some of that transition. I've also been able to see the relentless um, everyday toil of all these groups from Cape uh, to others. Um, the invention of Gold House. Um, I've been able to see all through the years that no matter what, they were always there and the supporters mm. were always there. And the old school people on the front lines who fought for our voices, who were in hundreds of movies playing uh, 
you know, stereotypical characters because they just had to get us on the screen. They had to work. Uh, those their their work is not in vain, and their uh, and their determination and persistence uh, means hu huge things. Means more than anything that I've ever done um, because they kept that door just slightly open enough for this generation to now burst through. Um, and it also created sort of this tradition that, you know, once you go through a door, it's not for one person mm -hmm. that you, uh, that it becomes a platform. And so, uh, it's, it's, it's also inspirational for a whole new generation of people. My dad just going to, uh, just being an Asian chef that goes to a career day at a high school, um, that may have seemed like silly to me as a kid, um, and maybe even to you, but actually, uh, how many people have come up to me and told me that they were introduced to Chinese food or Chinese culture oh, through my man. dad or how cool they thought he was being a Chinese chef. Whereas if he isn't doing that, someone else is telling him the story of a Chinese chef. And that was always pressed upon me by my dad. He's like, I am a part of this community. We are the, we are ambassadors for uh, this community. And uh, we have to present ourselves the way we want to present ourselves because that's their, how they're going to see the next Chinese family that comes through. You know, we had five kids. We roll into a restaurant. It is chaos. <laughs> and so my parents are always like, dress right, act right, because guess what? Next time a Chinese family comes in, we want them to treat them right. And if, if we're not right, then they will treat the next family like shit. So that was that was very heavily uh, put on me. So anyway, back to Hollywood. That is that's sort of the mentality of 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 a lot of the sort of old school um, trailblazers who came in, and now it's really exciting. But it's not easy because now we've we've made a little bit of room, and now we got to deliver and deliver great content. Deliver. Um, interesting content, not just the same old, same old. We have to now push ourselves to be better artists, so we rise to the top, and we um, and we uh, earn the spots at the top. Um, and so I just feel like, uh, and now we actually have to know what we want to say. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we don't have an answer for everything. So, and mm -hmm. we probably disagree a lot with each other. And so we're going to have to fight that out amongst mm -hmm. each other without eating each other. Um, that is both scary, dangerous, but also like, I trust that we're all gonna work through it. But I think it's really important that we all have to remind ourselves, like we're all here to get to the same place on the moon. And uh, we may twist and turn how to get there and build different rocket ships and collide with each other sometimes, but we still all are all trying to get to that moon. And so um, we have to give each other room to get there. So that that's what to me that next step is. We have to get better. Now we have to, and 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 we have to work with each other or get out of each other's way so that we can see uh, what everyone has to bring to the table. Now I know you're you're home and you have a lot of meetings and you're always you know there's tons of projects you're juggling even with COVID happening. Maybe not shooting as much per se, right? Yeah, yeah. But um, you know I, I still look at you as kind of the one of those people that you're kind of at the epicenter of Asian Americans in mainstream media, right? I mean, you can't deny it when Crazy Rich Asians is what it became and what it is. And it was amazing. Is I'm not asking, is there pressure on you? Because, you know, from my perspective, people that would come up to me, it's like, oh my gosh, like, it's so great to see an Asian person doing this. And I'm always like, you know, I am thankful. And a part of me is like, you know, I'm part of this whole kind of movement of Asians in media. I'm just a sliver of this piece of the puzzle. And at the same time, I can't sp speak for all Asians because obviously none of us can. We can only speak from our own yeah. experiences. Has there been, now that Crazy Rich Asians has even exploded, there was pressure before, right? There's actually almost always pressure. There's pressure before the movie was made. Yeah. There's pressure <laughs> as the movie's coming out. There's pressure now for the next movie. Yeah. Um, do you just try and put blinders on and just be in your craft or can you feel it at times? Because also there's a studio pressure that's like, hey, yeah. we need to pay. We need to make that money too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all those pressures are very real. Um, yeah, I have. I I think part of my uh, maybe my the only superpower I actually have <laughs> is that um, I can cut a piece of my brain out of my heart and be like, I don't give a fuck. Just keep going. I trust that I know what I'm doing. 
And that took years of making videos as a teenager and trying to convince people to let me use their place, their house, their hallway, uh, convincing my friends who didn't really want to be in a movie to be in a movie. And I, and I would like yell at them to like move their head or say a line. And um, like when you're young and you've got to get something done and you know the pieces you need to get to, you, you're forced to uh, be very laser focused on mm -hmm. your work and getting it done. And that at the end of the day, people may not understand what you're doing, but at the end of the day, when they watch it, they'll get it and everything you have done will be worth it. And so I'm sort of used to that feeling. It doesn't make it easier. You know, when you hear people, you know, when we first hired Henry, um, I, when I first saw Henry, he'd never been in a movie before. Mm -hmm. I saw his stuff and I was like, this guy's a freaking star. Like, mm -hmm. first of all, Nick Young in the book is a very specific, he has to have this English accent. He was, you know, raised in like, that's a hard character to find, let alone any leading man in any race is difficult in a movie. I don't think people realize how difficult it is to be a leading man. That said, um, um, sp found him on the internet and, uh, and then getting hammered for it because they don't know who he is. They, oh, he's mixed race. There's all this stuff that comes with it. And, you know, you, it could have crushed me and be like, okay, never mind, forget Henry Golding. But I know, I've seen everyone. I saw thousands of people online and in person. Literally. And there was <laughs> one Henry Golding, and he's a very specific <laughs> thing. And there's one Nick Young, and he had to be that role. There was no question. He was freaking living in Singapore. So, again, people don't have to agree with with me of why or how that's why it's a movie and i'm the director and i get a perspective and that's why also i get shit on because when when i get shit on because i make the decision so i get that but it doesn't make it easy to get through that and then when when it comes out then he's like a superstar and everyone's like oh my gosh how'd you find henry <laughs> golding entertainment tonight wants to know <laughs> you don't get to go back to those twitter people and be like are you gonna say sorry now like is that better now? Are you guys now going to take it back? No, they're like off on another. They don't even remember they tweeted that. So again, you just get used to that. It's nothing bad about those people. In fact, I, you know, the more criticism, especially, you know, I have to make choices. Like there are both economic choices, production, physical choices. Some people aren't available. Now, you know, casting um, the cream of the crop Asian actors uh, from around the world I had full reign when I was doing Crazy Rich Asians because nobody was hiring them for a big Hollywood movie. Now everyone wants to hire them. So now I got to get on their schedule. Even just to like have lunch with Henry Golding, I got to get on his fucking schedule. So um, look what you created, John. Look what you did. Aquafina, I haven't seen in months. Come on, Aquafina, text me back. No, they're all so we're, we're, we're always in contact and they're all great. But, you know, it's great. That's like, that's the, that's the amazing thing about it. So, yeah, it's hard, I guess, but I can cut it out. And and you know what? If as a creator, you have to think that you're always making something new. You can't dwell on what people are going to think or what you did in the past. Like you're a creator, you're creating. If you're thinking about other things, then you're not a creator anymore. So I try to keep myself in that mode. Um, and 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 then and then win or lose, and I've, I've I've had one where I lost big. You move forward, and I learned. I taught myself to not uh, be motivated by the result, by the result of other people what they think of it, but more mm -hmm. by what I wanted to accomplish in creating this thing. Um, so, uh, yeah. Anyway, th that's that's sort of how I get through. I'm sure well, the same you know, way that you, the way you know mm -hmm. when you when you're creating your show um, and what they expect from you and how they expect you to act and how they like, you can only do so much. And that's also the case for more voices because then they'll, you can't serve everybody. So someone else can serve that thing and you can serve another thing. Like that's, that's, that's the great world that, that, that we live in. So. Okay. I have a question, a personal question about a uh, crazy rich Asians because you know, I, I know how studios think and crazy rich Asians is such an iconic name in film now um, I know you guys are, are you, how far are you in the writing process of the second movie? Are you kind of still, you know, where are you at with that? I know you're smiling right now. <laughs> where are you at with that? That's the big question, bro. We're working on it. We're working on it. And um, I don't want to give you too many details because everyone gets all up in the details, but uh, we're going to make it great. 
but making something great sometimes takes a little time uh, to find it. We, you know, we changed a lot in that first book. Um, so the second and third book are great, but sometimes the things don't connect because we solve some of those things and some of the things that uh, th that in the book they they don't solve. And so so we're working on that. Plus, you want to see characters that you love. And some of those characters disappear in the second and third book. So um, we're, we're working all those things out. Um, and uh, there's no way we're going to make a movie that doesn't have something bold to say and do. Um, and so I'm very careful of making sure that, that's, that we serve that first and foremost. So I, I'm thinking like a studio thinks right now. And the second book is named Rich China Girlfriend. But because Crazy Rich Asians is such a name, have you guys thought of maybe calling it Crazy, Crazy Rich Girlfriend? Like just to keep the crazy rich name in there. Am I onto something or am I not? <laughs> Listen, we're not that far in terms of <laughs> name for it, but you know, it has a true. It's called China Rich Girlfriend. It is what it. Yeah. It is what uh, that book is. I, I'm China not rich sure they would yeah, change. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I think you could call it Crazy Rich Asians Two China Rich Girlfriends. Like I think that oh, yeah, more, yeah. that makes more sense to be honest. Um, and I think people want that Crazy Rich Asians name in there to know what it is, but. Who knows? That's not my job, ultimately. Exactly. You're like, I don't care. I'm just going to make a badass film. Who cares? Exactly. The, um, you know, you talked about you've been in film. Like, people may not remember. I hope they do. I think fans of yours do. But you've seen, really, the true evolution of media from traditional media. You had the LXD League of Extraordinary Dancers series on YouTube. And, really, that series came out, if I remember, kind of – as YouTube was kind of maturing, but not when YouTube had exploded to what it was. I mean, it was quality, you know, it was high quality content. You can still see it today yeah, at a yeah. time where YouTube was still trying to figure it out. You know, you explore yeah. that internet media. You've now seen streaming services, you know, or have you been surprised or are there any things that have stuck out in your mind of just how media has just changed so much in basically 10 years? I'm, I'm completely surprised by it. I mean, back in the day when we were doing it, it was they were called web series. <laughs> and we're like, <laughs> yeah, that's oh, right, that's right. web series. Ew. And they now, weren't giving you, and people were like, uh, yeah, right, the way you said it, exactly. Yeah. Like, oh, web series, okay. <laughs> it's like, no, it's a web event series. Um, I don't know, web seems so tiny. And now they don't even call it, it's like streaming. Um, <laughs> they, they had to have had a meeting where they're like, we're not calling, we can't call this web content anymore so i don't even know i don't think kids know what a web is um so <laughs> they never heard of web crawlers uh, yeah the world ww wide web. world wide web they don't even say that they don't even say they, it. Don't, even, they don't even know what that is um they don't say that so yeah i i was i i was, and, and literally uh, the front row a front row seat to mm -hmm. technology invasion because again we're from the bay area so i was in a very unique seat of seeing you know my first web browser early in high school um and then um and and then netscape and doing that whole watching that whole stuff and watching videos start to go on e-bombs world before oh even gosh. youtube yeah i know you watched a lot of e-bombs world <laughs> stuff so like um and then also napster distribution so so going to school for the first time for college where they had a, a you know a network that could connect so you could have any song in the world because everybody had a computer connecting to it. I was in the Mac group, and the Mac, they, it wasn't as big. Um, I remember going into different dorm rooms because I could see who had a Mac um, and, uh, and introducing myself to all the Mac users. There was 12 <laughs> of us in, like, a building of 1,200 people. It was crazy. So, mm -hmm. um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> I got to witness, A, the rise of Apple, uh, this the the third rise of Apple. I got to witness um, when we were doing YouTube. When when I made, when I graduated from college and my short film that got me into the business, mm -hmm. there was no place to put it online. I had no place to host it unless I was going to pay for it myself. So there was no YouTube. This is two thousand two. Um, I had this was the VHS. convenience store. Was that the convenience store short film? Yeah, uh, uh, no, that one was even before that. So oh, that okay, was okay. even earlier. Um, and so, but with, with uh, when the kids were away, which is a whole musical thing, that I, I had to, it's not online even to, to today. Um, that was on either a DVD, a DVD-R that I had to make, or on a, a, a VHS tape. Um, that's how most people saw it. This mm -hmm. is 2002, 2003. So um, then when, when YouTube came around, 
that was like a revelation because I hadn't really been editing stuff or making little videos. Um, I was working on my movies and developing my movies. And, and when I was making Step Up to the Streets, I got my camera out again, um, shooting on HDV. Um, and I shot these little HDV tapes, um, or mini HDV, um, and uh, cut something together in the movie. You'll see there's like a prank video in the movie. I, I shot that and cut it together. And it reminded me like, oh, yeah, I love cutting all this stuff together in mm -hmm. Premiere or whatever. And so I started making a blog on YouTube of just behind the scenes stuff. Nobody was watching it, but it was like fun to make it making of a of a of um of Step Up 2, my first movie. And then I got my the actors involved in it and it was really fun. And at that point MySpace was was really big. And Step Up <laughs> on MySpace was even bigger. Like that was like a huge destination for people. I had one of the most uh interactions with the fans. And so we embraced that. I got to learn a lot about that. And then when I finished Step Up 2 and it came out, Adam Savani, who plays Moose in Step Up 2, gets a call from a Miley Cyrus random. Oh. They're both like 14, 15 at that point. And Miley Cyrus leaves a message saying, hey, I saw Step Up 2. I loved you in it. Great job. But didn't leave her number. So this 14-year-old kid's calling me back. Like, Yo, dude, how do I get Miley's <laughs> number? She just called me. How do I do that? I'm like, bro. I don't know. He's like, can you call her agent? I'm like, I don't, that's weird. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but I was like, you know, because we were going to make a YouTube video. I was like, listen, she has a YouTube video. She has a YouTube channel with her friend Miley, uh, Mandy, Miley and Mandy show. And you know, they know all these dancers because we know all these dancers too. Let's challenge them to a dance off that's and right. let's us make a video. And this could be your way to like, you know, say hello. And so we got all our dances together. We made this video and challenged her to the biggest dance battle in YouTube history. There had not been any dance battles in YouTube history. So technically, <laughs> I, I, whether there have been or not, it still is. It still is actually. And so we yeah. made this video and challenged them and just left it up. Two days later, she responds with her own video with her friend um, Mandy, and they made this, they, they pulled out all the stops. I mean, she's like the biggest star in the world at that moment, and she got all her dancers. Um, Cole Wallace shot it all with his fancy cameras and editing, and in the end, they had Channing Tatum and Jenna Dewan in it, uh, making fun of us, which is kind of a slap in our face since they're Step Up family. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then the war was on, so then we're like, oh, Fuck no. So we brought, we brought our Rolodex out and we got like Adam Sandler and Lindsay so Lohan. Sick. We had Chris so Brown. Um, we had we had all these people. Um, um, Diana Ross. Um, it was crazy. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and it blew up. That video, that dance battle blew up. Miley responded again with like Ryan Seacrest and I don't know, helicopters and all this. So it became this thing. Millions of hits. Especially in 2000, this is 2008. Uh, huge. So YouTube was two years old at that point, I think. And so um, it became this whole thing. That w is where I realized the power. Um, because I had done the stumbling with the studio. And now this was all on our own with mm. the same cast. And we're making stuff that's driving marketing for our movie. But we're not part of the marketing department. It's just us. I'm editing everything. I'm shooting everything. There's no corporate overlord. And same thing with Miley, who was already working for Disney. She probably wasn't really fully allowed to be doing YouTube videos, but they didn't understand that. She has an exclusive deal with Disney. Suddenly, this is becoming mainstream, like on Entertainment uh, Tonight, on the E! Yeah, channel. On... She hosts Teen Choice Awards, and they actually, we do a live battle there. And she's hosting, so it's part of the whole show. I mean, this is like insane, from online to prime time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where the LXD was created because then she was shut down by Disney. It was like you can't do, you can't create your own show <laughs> by yourself. And then we were we were friends with all their her dancers, so we're like, okay, let's take this audience and let's create our own fake dance battle, but but mytho mythological superhero style. And so we created the Legion of Extraordinary Dancers and told the story of these dancers, but through a superhero uh, sort of lens, and got money from Hulu to do it when Hulu had never. Had, I think we were their first original anything. They didn't even have like a strategy. So they just gave us a bunch of money to do whatever we wanted. We made these 15 minute dance shorts, three seasons of that, full free reign. We, I had no executive mm -hmm. I was talking to. It was still a web series, but that launched this idea that you could do high quality um, mm -hmm. content on there. 
So I was, we were right there to witness it all. You know, it never picked up to full mainstream, mainstream at that point, but we toured all around the world. We toured with Glee. We uh, performed at the Emmys, I mean, at the Oscars. Um, we did a TED Talk in Vancouver at the on the main stage, or uh, at that point it was in Long Beach. So we saw it coming, but um, the wave didn't happen until like five years after, after that. Um, we just saw the cracks of it and we saw the possibilities. Um, and so that was really exciting. And so, so this whole, we didn't, I didn't know that big, the big conglomerates, the big studios would then spend all their money <laughs> plus money because that's movie money, not tech money. Tech money is like 10 times larger. I didn't know tech money was going to roll in and just create a whole new industry, which is what is happening. Um, and so that, that's, uh, both scary and exciting. Um, but good to know we were sort of right there um and uh, right when it was sort of beginning but this is also interesting because your experience is being able to see the wave before it actually happens and know like this is gonna this is gonna be the thing you know eventually it may not be there but i all you know this is also you actually get real views of how many people actually watched your video right an actual metric of like who's watching and where you arguably and, and had one of the first collabs like true collabs you know youtube is all yeah. about collabs now yeah, that was a collab sure. right there, right? Right. You have the, you're we didn't even call it a collab. So, yeah. and that was real, by the way. Miley and Adam, the the fourteen year old kid Moose, had actually never met until the night of the Teen Choice Awards when we were in person, and I believe they made out that night. So, <laughs> all I'm saying is I'm a great wingman. Second part I would say <laughs> is that, um. YouTube was also the platform for Asian Americans to have a voice, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. democratization of actual like being out there um, from um, so many Kev Jumba, um, Higa, Higa to yeah. Wong Fu. Yeah. I mean, I remember seeing Wong Fu stuff. Uh, well, Phil specifically when he was going to San Diego State, I think is where we went and he would make these like uh, lip sync videos of Justin Timberlake. And he was like, so cool. And he had all these dancers. I was like, oh, that's like a cool Asian. How cool. And, and he like making music videos. Um, so to see that, um, I think I saw uh, Jabberwockies. No, actually I, I saw Jabberwockies in person first, but like all those people, all those dancers, what, what, an, what an incredibly powerful place to go when no one's giving you the microphone. And we're seeing the seeds of that now. We're seeing the people who trained in that world coming into now, you included. So th that is that's where I feel like uh, technology really um, opened the floodgates for a lot of talent that was being shut out, and also allowed people to see like, oh, there are all these people that are so talented, and and why don't we see them? And that question being asked had to go work all the way up the ladder. You know, when you talk about up the ladder, I was, was kind of leading to that because you've been able to see these things, you see these trends, you've been specifically involved in projects that have been ahead of the curve before their time. I mean, Crazy Rich Asians was that perfect moment too. And that kind of speaks to how, you know, right place, right time, right skill set, right, right relationships. It, it, yeah. all, it all matters in this. Yeah. And I'm not saying right now that you need to say anything negative about Hollywood because you are part of that Hollywood family, but there are dynamics between the studio heads and 100%. directors like you, right? So what, what do you think is the thing that they, things are changing, but they don't, it's not all of a sudden like, they're like, oh, hey, you know, we're going to make all these Asian projects all of a sudden just because Crazy Rich Asians is there, like they open their mind, right? And there are things that are happening in the background. You talked about, you know, yeah. even more opportunities for actors, but it's not like all of a sudden happens. What what is it kind of, what do you see in their mind that kind of takes them so long to realize it? Is it just come down to green, the money green, right? Then they go, okay, there's a, there's an audience. They can see the numbers on YouTube as a point of like, although it's a different medium, they can at least say there are audiences here that we can, you know, work towards or cater to or make content for, but it, Crazy Rich Asians was that thing. You were there. So what was it that, to, what did it take or what does it take for that light bulb to switch where we start, you know, not just social consciousness in general, but they're the ultimate ones that still are gatekeepers. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's be very clear. When we say they, it means 
thousands of people. Um, when we say um, gatekeepers, there are many, <laughs> many keys, and there's not one giant gate. Um, when we say uh, the audience, that means green. It doesn't mean what you say on Twitter. It doesn't mean what you write on on your blog. It means, are you paying the green? Because the studios, the conglomerates, ultimately it comes down to shareholders and shareholders are people, is society, whoever is putting in that money. And the only language they speak is green. Like that's it. Mm -hmm. Not to be crass about it, but that's the language they speak. So you, you can have leaders who want to change stuff, who are socially conscious, but they work for somebody else who works for somebody else who works for us, the shareholders, who work, who then look at the audience, us, uh, of where we're putting the green. And so if we're not putting the green there, then they're not changing their minds and they're not sending the message to the next group, to send to the next group, to send to the person who cares uh, to make that change. Crazy Rich Asians helped show that the that there was a possibility to make a lot of green if done right. And there was a talent pool that was ready to uh, be utilized um, if utilized in the right way. And there was an audience that was going to put down green if convinced enough that it was worth their time and their money. And so it is a circular, full on, much more complicated idea than one studio exec. Hey, one studio exec can make a big, can make a big um, change for sure. But that change has to be backed up by then an audience saying you're right. Um, and so if we're not saying you're right, then they get handcuffed more and more and more. So then it comes down to the content itself the creators, you better be making they listen, it's hard to make a good thing, no matter what you're trying to make. That's just, mm -hmm. that's just a fact. Um, creators are hard to come by. Everyone wants to make stuff. And everyone has the right to make stuff and should make stuff. But to make something that people actually will pay money to see, that's a different category. And by the way, not all great artists should be making stuff to make money. Most of the great artists that we know never made any money. So you want to be a great artist and change the world in that way. Like you, you probably shouldn't be on the front lines of a lot of the stuff, but if you want to be on trying to change the corporate side of this, where the giant money is going towards, then that's a different war. And that war is how are you going to make something that mainstream audiences are going to want to see again, that's not a movie that everybody wants to make, but like, that's how you get the green. How do you use talent that is going to intrigue not just a small group of people, but everyone around the world? How do you um, uh, create a, a world that people are intrigued to come into and watch? I mean, that's, that's, that's entertainment. That's the business of entertainment first and foremost. So it's very complicated. So you have to have people who are willing to do that. I was very lucky because my taste is in pop culture. Like I love pop culture. I grew up in pop culture. It's why I, you know, I watched MTV relentlessly. It's why I went to shows, Broadway shows and concerts and uh, uh, operas and ballets constantly. It's why I was friends with dancers and musicians. And it's why I went to see stuff in the movie theater, bought all the toys, tried to make my own versions. Like it's just a part of who I am. And not everybody's like that. I'm like constantly eating it. I'm like a fast food. <laughs> You know, <laughs> junkie. you don't want to be me, but the advantage of being me is I recognize, and that took me years for people to shove it in my face and tell me that I recognize that I actually have an instinct that matches if I could get the, if I could get the understanding of what I needed to do in this world, I could, I could actually like merge into that intersection. I could actually be that intersection. Uh, same way as my father was the intersection of understanding his customers and understanding Chinese culture and food and understanding mm -hmm. the place and the time that he was in. He had to change his food in, in order to fit into a 1969 Bay Area, which had mm -hmm. never, which didn't have Chinese restaurants uh, the way he, especially at, 
at, at that time, at that moment. I mean, I think it was only like two years prior where, 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 where federally um, uh, um, marriages of different races could, could actually get married. Like that's insane to me. Um, mixed marriages like that could actually exist. So, so, so he had to do his thing in order to survive for 50 years and have a restaurant that crosses all boundaries all and be able to go to a, a, a high school and be able to uh, go to soccer games and present what Chinese New Year's is and whatever, whatever. Have cooking classes for people to come to. So for me, it's like, I just happen to be in a category of a movie that I like to make. And I have an opportunity to make something that then can cross a boundary that maybe other people who are into this stuff don't, aren't, aren't focused on. Um, we need more people, I guess, who do that thing. And that's not everybody. And a lot of filmmakers um, should not do that because that's not their thing either. Um, but I understand, I, so I can't really speak for everything else, but I can speak, and, and by the way, we need the other movies too, because those are the, like, those are the things that, that are high art and can, and can paint the picture of, of, of true things that I, that, that the world may not fully be ready yet, but, but, but when they see it changes a lot of people's brains to then bring more of mm -hmm. it. Absolutely. So anyway. That to me, I, I feel like it's just more complicated than why aren't they hiring more Asians? There's a whole chain of events that have to happen and that takes time. And by the way, this frustration and this um, banging on the door is part of that. We should feel that way. It should, everyone should be complaining. Everyone should be keep doing that. That's the only way in a meeting, which by the way, I've had now that in meetings that I had five years ago, would, three years ago would have never happened where people like, well, how are we going to have an Asian person in this? Well, how, what's the, who's, uh, we can't just have an Asian person be that person. It can't just be a, a computer person with purple hair. Like, uh, like that's like not, that's like, we have to do, we have to do more. Um, and so I think that that's, uh, this is a good position we're in. It's uncomfortable, but it's a good position. And we just have to be, keep, keep, keep going and, and, and it'll, it'll chip away. Um, but we just need to keep going. I really that's appreciate that talk. insight because, you that's know, talk. <laughs> yeah, that, that, well, you did do a TED talk, but I think that, you know, you, you, that's such a nuanced, like the whole thing. There's so many different flips and switches. Like when someone gets mad about this, to your point, like that's why I really appreciate you kind of basically breaking it down for people that really don't understand you. You are the inside, like you're kind of like that link where most people could just never understand because they're just seeing these movies. They don't see themselves represented. They don't understand why and they just get mad about it, right? Yeah. Whereas, so I really, that was just some great stuff in there. And I hope that people are listening can understand and not, they shouldn't be mad about it. They should just keep on pushing forward. I don't think it. Pushing forward. Mad. And by the way, you're, you have every right to be mad and you have every right to do that stuff. Uh, put pressure on me, all that stuff. Like, and, and my job is to not get bogged down by it. My job is to hear it, hear it when I need to hear it. Maybe it's, maybe things I'm not paying attention need to be shoved into my face more so that when as on my journey, I can take that into account. Um, but it's just complicated. It's just hard in that way. So, um, and, and I am not the only, there's so many people um, who are coming um, to save us for sure. The next, <laughs> just next generation of filmmakers don't give a fuck. So it's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bold, right. They don't have those limitations bold, or those ideas confidence. in their brains. Yeah. A hundred percent. We have, you know, my brother has more baggage than me. He's the older one and I have less baggage than him. And I have more baggage than the next guy or girl, and, and they have more baggage than the next one. And, and that's how we get free. All right, John, I just had kind of one more quick. That was amazing. Thank you for that. I, I really value, you know, the fact that you took your time out to hang out with us and talk. Um, I do have one more question, just yeah. kind of, you know, you've all these projects you do, all these movies you've done shows. I know they're like children and no one's ever going to say what's your favorite. You know, we have so many amazing stories from Crazy Rich Asians about like the uh, the Rolex watch, about Michelle Yeoh's <laughs> emerald engagement ring mm -hmm. and showing just kind of that hustle and innovation and just like on the spot thing. Is there is there any story maybe you haven't really talked about that comes to mind because Crazy Rich Asians is now what a year plus so in the background. So you can kind of is there any story from that movie or that experience that maybe you haven't talked about that kind of just a nugget that sticks out in your mind from it? Uh, I'm sure there is. Um, 
But I'm trying. I don't know how exciting they are. If you it give me matter. one scene, I will. I will give you a full on because I can. If I watch, if, if anyone says one thing in the movie, I can go on a whole thing about what happened, what led to all those. Things. Okay, so, how about this? One scene, yeah. The food market scene. Okay. In Singapore, because right. that authentically made me fucking hungry, and I'm like, <laughs> food culture, Asians, baby. I love you, John M. Chu. So yeah, that that scene. <laughs> So when I read um, about that moment in the book and, um, I, and I was going to Singapore for the first time to go look at locations, I said, the first place we have to go is uh, a hawker market. So I landed and our people there was like, let's go. Let's, and so we, they took us to um, um, East Coast, which is an outdoor market, which a lot, most of them are actually not outdoor. Uh, Newton, the one we shot at, is outdoor but this place was like grilling it's on a beach basically it's grilling it's families what like really moved me was this was not just like um this was not just a hustle bustle place this was like families were there eating their dinner and people were on tables and on uh, and, and going on walks and were on the beach it was the most beautiful um portrait of what Singapore actually is, because we rolled into this amazing air, uh, airport flash. It was looked like a place of the future. We're driving through uh, buildings of the future. It was like this tropical deco um, Asian fusion thing. And then we land on this beach and it's like raw. And it's like people hanging out, friends. And I'm looking around like, these people are cool. They're artists, um, they're, um, their families, their grandparents, and they're eating. And they're eating the stuff that I, some stuff, not all of the stuff, some stuff I, I didn't know at the time, like Stingray and things like that. But they're eating the stuff that I also ate growing up. And the smells, that's like, and it, and it was so normal. And I was like, I love this. And I want, I need, when they come to Singapore, they need to come here first. Because I want them to experience Singapore the way I experience Singapore first. And, um, and the sun was setting. And so when we, ultimately we're doing in the movie like we gotta we gotta emulate that and i want them in a um a beat up car um and originally in the in the, originally actually in the movie they're really the um bride and groom you know they come in they seem like normal people and then they have like an entourage of cars and um we i think that section got cut out of the movie um, so instead the sort of beat up car comes in, they're supposed to have this entourage of cars and then the beat up car is the one they're getting into, even though those are all their like bodyguards and people. So we just kept the old car, they get in it. I just wanted that moment of like hanging out with friends, uh, eating and chilling because I had never seen that in a American studio movie, let alone a romantic comedy where it's just like, I want to be like those people. Mm. Most of the time, Asians are not aspirational in a movie, in a, in a in, you know American-driven movie, as aspirational. And that was like that picture of them hanging out. I wanted every kid, every teenage, every adult being like, "I wish I was with them right now." I think I thought that would do more for um, setting up both the characters in the movie and setting us up as people than. Um, then, then exploring exotic Singapore. <laughs> oh, Asia 101. Look at these people. How strange and how weird. Like that was off the table. It was. Mm -hmm. Look how familiar it is. Look how beautiful and warm it is. Hey, this is a better version of than you going to McDonald's that night with your buddies after getting high. You know, like this is this is the this is this is that next level version. Um, and so anyway, when we shot that, that's that's what we all felt at that point, point and wanted to. Ultimately, we couldn't shoot in uh, at East Coast uh, because of we couldn't get control of certain areas and we needed it for shooting. Newton, which is a great, um, you know, I think he says is the best one in the country. I got a lot of shit from that from a lot of Singaporeans. He's like, that's not the best. They're very protective of their opinions there, um, but but they um, but but you know Newton allowed us to be able to shoot a outdoors. There's not a lot of uh, markets that are outdoors, and B because uh, I wanted the grilling, I wanted the smoke and the grilling, um, and we got control of that courtyard, which was really really important for us to have. So 
that's what happened and it was hot as hell and um our actors were there and you they we ate a lot they couldn't stop eating it so um eventually we had to have spit bowls because they would eat you know we were doing so many takes i was like everybody <laughs> calm down we're gonna have to do a lot of these takes they're like no we're asian we're good we'll eat it all like, okay <laughs> five takes in they're like oh. It was very, it was very, I just hit my head. Um, that was, uh, it, it, it was very fun. So um, anyway, that's, that's, that's that section. Man, that thing, you know, just even you talking about the idea or the imagery that you wanted to give to American and Asian and Asian American audiences by going there just speaks to the thought. Cause a lot of times people don't realize the thought that not all, but many directors put into specifically making decisions that you don't even think about. Right. We yeah. just experience this feeling, this emotion, but there's 20, 30, 50 decisions that even may or may not get you to that place, but that's what you're trying to get us to. And uh, that, 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 that was awesome. But, you know, I, I thank you so much, friend. I mean, I, it's really, I loved how candid you were able to kind of give a lens because you are kind of like that. A lot of people don't have access or the ability to see what you have seen, especially from our community. And so, I just want to say thank you, man. It was like so much fun talking to you. I mean, I felt no, like sorry. we could talk another hour, but I need to respect your time too. <laughs> thank you. You know, I, I, I just make a movie. I just make movies every couple of years, but like for you, you're on that front line every day uh, representing us and, um, and not just us Asian Americans, but us as a new generation and us as techies and mm -hmm. all those things. And so I, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, you're either in media, you're either on the, uh, on, 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 on the light or in the dark. And I really appreciate that you're, you're always about the light. So, Thanks, my man. All right, John. Well, we'll talk to you soon. Do it again sometime. But thank you. And, you know, continued success with and being busy with films, kids, TV projects, all the above. And Apple announcements. Oh, I'm, okay. October 13th. Let's go. October 13th. And also, <laughs> Singapore opened a new floating I Apple know. store in the Bay. And I got to like imagine... You're going to go. I got to imagine you're going to visit that place when we go, go back. I, gotta go there. I mean, it looks like a lantern. It's floating on the water. <laughs> it's like so that. awesome. Go there. It's so freaking awesome. We'll figure All right, out. John. Thanks a lot, man. All right. Cool. See ya. Peace. Let's go 5G iPhone. <laughs> <laughs>